Hello, everyone. Uh, I'd like to welcome you tonight uh, and thank you for coming to the final panel of this year's Alumni Career Pathways Series. Uh, and I'd like to acknowledge that this event takes place on the unceded traditional territories of the Musqueam, Tsleil-Waututh, and Squamish nations. The Alumni Career Pathways Series is an annual three-part series brought to you by RBC that is presented by Alumni Relations in collaborations with Career Development and Work and Grid Learning and the Shumka Center for Creative Entrepreneurship. Tonight's panel is moderated by Alan Goldman, who is an, also an ECU alum. Alan began his career in radio and was part of the award-winning team that produced the five-part national CBC radio documentary series, A Matter of Survival, hosted by Dr. David Suzuki. Alan is also a filmmaker who has made a number of documentaries, including Finding Freedom, which captures the brutal reality asylum seekers seeking a new life and the recently completed Bending Light, which recounts the expedition of the international team of astro astronomers to prove Einstein's theory of general relativity. He has taught courses in the field of film, of documentary, digital media at numerous institutions, completing his MM, MAA at Emily Carr University of Art and Design with a focus on effect of 3D on documentary filmmaking. Alan is also the industry liaison for research at ECU, where he helps manage employer-specific service projects and the creation of student internships. Alan, please take it away and introduce our panelists. Hi, everyone. Uh, good to see you all. Um, I'm going to do the plug for you, Teresa, now so I don't forget. Um, up here, you'll see a code that you can scan with your phone. And I think there's a, a survey there. Yeah, awesome. OK, so um, we want your feedback. OK, so I'm really excited to uh, be moderating this panel. And thank you for coming. Um, you can get closer if you want, because um, we're, we're not even sure how many folks we've got here yet, but it, we, we can make this conversation more intimate if you want. So come on up. And um, I just wanted to, I'm, I'm really happy to be here with all these fantastic alums of our university. It's so amazing to see um, all the, the work that they do and, and how hard they're working. So let's make this about them and really, um, uh, get to know them in this in this panel. So on my left uh, here is Jeremy Jude Lee. Did you go by Jeremy or J Jeremy? Jeremy's okay. 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 Jeremy is an artist and photographer based in Vancouver. He's known for his storytelling narratives of nostalgia, which is really present in your work. We got to talk about that. Inspired by sim cinema, skate culture, and music, his body of work. Uh, is uh, also inspired by cross-cultural identity, transcending time through memory, and evoking emotion through colors and composition, I'll say. Uh, a graduate from Emily Carr University of Art and Design. He has a BFA in photography. He has been working as a photographer for 10 years, which is a no mean feat, and collaborating with brands such as Arcteryx, Lou, Lou Lemon, Hyper Beast, while continuing to pursue his personal and artistic practice. I think there's more here. Yeah, Jeremy's photography work has been featured in publications such as Days, High Snobbity, Sno <laughs> what is this, the <laughs> <laughs> yeah. magazine, and Boom, and worked with clients including Apple, Aritzia, Lululemon, Meta, Monos, and more. So, so he's, he's out there, and he's working hard and getting a lot of stuff done. Okay, on my immediate right is uh, Fedya Vink Avetsky. Uh, he's a Montreal, are you Montreal based? Okay, uh, son of Russian immigrants. Uh, his upbringing was shaped uh, between Texas and Canada. His parents uh, played a significant role in his love for cinema. Uh, it runs deep in his family. And if he, are you into Russian constructivism? No, sort of, okay. Um, uh, and he first picked up a camera to film his friends skateboarding, quickly realized he preferred film and editing over skating. 
smart man. Uh, this passion combined with his love for music naturally led him to direct music videos where his creative journey began. After graduating from Emily Carr, uh, Fedya moved to Montreal where he's transitioned into commercial fashion filmmaking, com collaborating with brands like Sheertex, Simmons, and Ardeen outside of the commercial world. His personal projects explore themes of vulnerability, the immigrant experience, and the passage of time. So, yeah. And um, finally, but not lastly, we have Isabella Dagnino uh, on our far right here. Uh, she is a lens-based artist um, residing on the unceded territory of the Musqueam, Squamish, and tsleil um, Their art practice is rooted primarily in analog medium and large format photography as well as analog experimental filmmaking. As someone with Latinx, you may have to explain <laughs> Latinx, indigenous and settler ancestry, much of their work examines the experience shaped by their cultural background and their relationship to place and community. Community figures strongly figures strongly in their work. Outside of their direct art practice, they're also a member of Dogpile Media, good name, a photo collective made of BIPOC and queer lens based artists in the underground music scene. Alongside they work their this work, they also they are also deeply committed to forms of grassroots activism through anti pipeline action and using their camera as a tool of direct action. Awesome. They received their Bachelor of Arts Fine Arts from University of Fraser Valley and their Masters in their MFA from Emily Carr University. So let's give it a big round of applause to all our panelists. Okay, so um, I had the pleasure of being able to look at everybody's work and spend some time with it. Um, and i am got to say that some, there's some amazing work here. Um, you, you all are playing with very traditional mediums, it seems, and, and sort of taking the tropes that you learned uh, while you were here and sort of flipping them and moving them around in different facets and ways. And I'm sort of interested in how all that works. And maybe I can start with Isabella. Like, well, what drew you to the, the medium of photography? Um, I was about like 15 when I first picked up a camera and it was just that, um, I wanted to document my friends. I wanted to kind of document like life, what we were doing, skateboarding, making music, um, being just like a rambunctious punk. Um, and then it just stuck and I kept doing it. And that's kind of what made me continue to keep working with it. Cause I realized it was a way to visually tell story about my community and the people around me. With, with your work in particular, you're, you seem to be interested a lot too in perspective and the relationship between um, objects and subjects and and buildings and and feeling like they're in the middle of like your work reminds me of like uh, your the buildings are almost take on a Diane Arbisk feel can you talk about that at all a little bit, I guess. Um, I guess the way that I'm looking at landscape and the way that I'm looking at like the places around me is that like I'm working with them in a way, in the sense that I believe that like when we're looking at land and we're looking at place, there's like a history that lives in there. And the celluloid specifically is just a conductor to tell that story and kind of bring out those histories. We work collaboratively through the lens. Um, so I think that might be what kind of translates through in a lot of my images, but then also I do recognize I come from a very traditional stylistic point of view, my aesthetics. So sometimes that might kind of come through as well. Um, but yeah, that's kind of my approach. Okay. So, um, and I would like to ask the same question of, of, of you guys. Um, you know, you, you've spent a lot of time in photography, um, you have a ton of images up on your website, which are amazing. Um, can you talk about what it's like for you and when you're thinking about uh, composition and what you want to take pictures of and what you're striving for with, with the work that you do? Um, 
I think it's on. Hello? I, uh, I guess it's a big question, but um, nowadays, I think, I think early on when I was just trying to figure out like how I was going to make a living as a photographer and like do it as a job, I was trying to find a way to merge what I thought I could get hired for with the things that interest, interested me. Uh, so I'm always doing a little bit of that, but I think now uh, I'm trying to figure out more just like when I'm out, what what is reminding me of something or like what's what's evoking a feeling in me that reminds me of something or like will help me like remember whatever that moment was that I was living at that very time. Um, yeah, I, I think I'm trying, I'll always be referencing my interest in my work because that's where it always started from but um now i'm just trying to I, th I feel like i'm just trying to document my experiences more than anything now okay and how about a similar question for you fed yeah like your work has elements of nostalgia in it you're you're very interested in taking celluloid and making it into something else like um and there's a lot going on in your frames and the work and your work the work that I see is most more in the 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 moving image space. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm sorry. Could you repeat the first part of that question one more time? Like, uh, yeah. So, I mean, you're you're very much interested in um, taking the modernism and and nostalgia and sort of mixing them together and almost mashing things up. Like, is is that a fair comment? Yeah, I think uh, in general, like for with my style, I love to create a nostalgic feeling with uh, you know the films that I'm doing because, to be honest, um, it feels like we're in a time right now where you know a lot of uh, the inspiration that people are gathering in fashion and in music videos and stuff like that, people are going back you know to the past. There's it feels as though everything is oversaturated right now, and um, the only way we can look is backwards and in some respects. So I think that, um, you know, a lot of people want this, this feeling of nostalgia and of, uh, you know, um, remembering maybe a time that was better or worse or something like that. But I just think, uh, in general, it's, I guess I found that style because 16 millimeter film was just something that I was drawn to, uh, even at my time here at Emily Carr. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's so it's so odd to be seeing you guys work in in all some of the you know you're working in sil with silver gelatin prints. Uh, your work harkens back to to me at least, and I'm an oldie uh, to to Kodachrome, like like you're really trying to go for color, and and your work like uh, you know I used to parade around the the national film board and look at everybody's 16 millimeter film when I was working in it. And the last thing we wanted to do was continue to work in 16 millimeter. It was so awful, <laughs> like, but, um, uh, just so time consuming. Um, and yet like you guys are all playing with these, these tropes, like, and making them your own, like what, what drive, what drives you towards that? Maybe Isabella, you can take that. Yeah, um, I guess for me it was just, that was what I had access to when I first started taking photos and I fell in love with it. For me it was just like, there's something really magical about working in a dark room and like kind of working with the celluloid because for me it very much is like something that is an interface and it's something that's alive and like you have to work collaboratively with it and there's something kind of really beautiful about getting to work with that magic in a way. Um, so yeah, that's kind of what drew me to that. And you, you have the sense of, uh, you have an, um, in your work, I see you, you're putting yourself in it either deliberately or not at times. Can you talk about that? Um, yeah. So like in, in what context? <laughs> Sorry. There's kind of a bit of you in each of your shots, but then you, you have this thing where you want to put yourself, um, you know, you, you put the, these flash, there was one where you're in the forefront of your image and you're, it's almost a 3D scape and you're looking down the, the road and there you are sort of um, 
almost in some kind of with motion blur kind of thing. Yeah, okay, so I, I know exactly which piece you're talking about. Um, yeah, so there's definitely a lot of intentionality if I'm present in the piece or not. Um, in my own art practice, aside from my like more commercial work um, and freelance work, um, it's because a lot of the time I'm making work that is coming from a really personal place. It's coming from lived experience. I believe strongly in only telling the stories that I understand and the ones I've lived. So it's very intentional if I'm out of the frame or in the frame. I never want to be the center. I never want to be fully, you know, the focus because it's, I'm just there to tell the story. And can we talk about color in your work a little bit? Um, if you haven't seen uh, Jeremy's work, it's, it's, it's worth a look. Um, he really obs is obsessed with color. It's almost like um, you you take the, there's, there's one picture that you have like that really struck me where there's this little boy and he's got his hand on this, I think on his dad and they're both wearing uh, uniforms of some sort like from sports and it's highly stylized but not like can, can you talk about what you're trying to do there um i uh i think my oof, how do i start when i was trying to establish a style for myself early on um I couldn't really put my finger on like the things that I wanted to pursue because I was like interested in a lot of different things, like a lot of, uh, like similar to those two, uh, started out skateboarding. I still do, it just hurts more. Um, I, because of my dad, I was super into movies and music because um, of my friends, like dabbling in like car culture, Did all these different things that I thought were really cool and interesting. And then when I was sh going out shooting, I was shooting all these different things and I was a little bit like, after, after a certain amount of time, I was looking at all this stuff I collected and I was really kind of insecure about like, oh, I don't really have a theme. Like, I don't like the things that I'm doing aren't like solid like I see other photographers. And I thought like maybe I was kind of uh, going nowhere. And then um, during the pandemic, I had the time to find, finally sit with my archive and like look for like common threads. And then I realized like when I put some of my pictures together, there was a lot of similar themes in terms of the colors that I was drawn to or like the types of feelings that I was uh, naturally uh, capturing or evoking in my frame because of either the subjects that I was uh, choosing to photograph or because of my interactions with them. So um, I started like as of only maybe the past few years, I've started trying to understand like what are my strengths as an image maker and like what what makes my um, what makes my work unique. Uh, similar in a similar way that Isabella was saying, it's like you can only really uh, tell stories that are from live experiences or like you can only really be the artist that you are like like because because any, anything that's going to resonate with anybody and any of your favorite mediums is always like the thing that feels most honest or like truth telling well in my opinion um so i don't know where i'm going with this but but like i'm so nowadays after i realized i have the, these these um themes and color, I started really leaning into that and like photographing things that I thought were really rich, rich and vibrant. And then in my editing, trying to uh, bring out whatever feeling it was that I felt at the time through my memory, because uh, I don't know, everybody sees the world differently. And if you have a unique voice as an image maker, you have to lean into like the way that you saw it or the way it made you feel. So that's what I'm trying to do. Mm. And, and just to follow that on, like how much of what you're shooting is composed on the spot and how much of it is you are you dealing with in a post-production process and and how, how do you sort of manage between what you see and what you want in an image uh initially i started with digital and then uh i what's it called uh in while i was at emily carr my uncle who is like the big uh, hobbyist tech collector guy he had uh this camera that he lent to me it's called a contacts g2 and i didn't know that it was like this famous camera at the time he just gave it to me and i shot a couple projects on it when i was in school but then i decided that i couldn't afford to keep shooting film so i just put it on the back burner uh but then when i was revisiting some of my well, I don't know, when I had been shooting so much digital that I didn't know what I was doing anymore, I, I found the contacts and I started shooting with it and I just had this look um, that made me feel like whatever I photographed was exactly the way I remembered it. 
Um, so I kind of just like, and yeah, embraced that. And then I started just like trying to push the colors to like the fullest extent and then figure out like what worked in the images that I really liked. And then trying to rep or at least like recognize where those moments were happening when I was out shooting the next time. And then I'm just trying to like, um, I don't know, just look for the moments that I'm naturally drawn towards uh, and make them happen over and over again. Mm. Thank you. Um, Fedya, your work seems to be like this dichotomy between light and dark. You're, you're, you're constantly struggling almost like with those two things. I watched that short film that you shot and it was, it was pretty dark. It was, it was, it was good. And then you're, uh, and then you're also like going for lightness and, and a, a touch of lightness, but you, but you always seem to go back to the dark too. What, what draws you to that place? Does this work? Okay, nice. Um, yeah, I mean, I think um, in a lot of ways, you know, it's, it's, it's very much like what we're trying to do as photographers and filmmakers is find the light, find where the sources of light are. And it's, you know, kind of reflective of, I don't know, I think for me, like I, I'm in a place where the commercial work that I'm doing is always a mix of, depending on each project, it could either be uh, very dark, it could be very light. It just really depends on uh, the client that I'm working with. Mm -hmm. And in my own personal work, I like to think that I go a little bit towards the darkness. Mm -hmm. uh, I try to capture like the shadow side and sort of, um, I guess my shadow self too, <laughs> but, um, but then with client work, you know, it's like, obviously if you're doing like something for a brand like Arden or Simons, they want everything bright and happy and, you know, and it's, so it's, I, I feel like as a DOP, it's, it's conflicting because sometimes, you know, you want to, to have that edgy, dark image, but then, you know, depending on who you're working with, maybe that they like that, maybe they don't, but yeah, in my own personal work, I think going towards the dark side is always, uh, yeah, something I'm that appeals to sort me. of the natural way, free thing that you gravitate towards. Yes, yes. Yeah. Okay, um, uh, Isabella, what this is about composition a little bit. Like, what what do you see when you're composing an image? Because some of your images it seems like you've you've thought a lot about the way they're composed and what you want in the frame. And can you? Can you talk about that? Like, do you spend oodles of time conceptually looking at that space before you photograph it? Or how, what do you do to get you yourself into a place where I'm going to make this photograph? That's a really great question. Um, well, like, it depends on, like, what the project is. But, like, a lot of the time, yeah, like, I will spend a lot of time in a space um, for my MFA thesis. I focused a lot on my hometown. Um, and I was going back, like, constantly and just, like, sometimes spending time in spaces before I shot them. Um, and for me, like, in that project in particular, it was really important to kind of just get to know the space, understand it, and like spend time there before I even brought my camera out. And anything that has to do with being on the land, um, I try to do that because it's important to also like walk with care in the space before I start bringing out a camera. So I think that's something that translates a lot through certain images I make. Yeah, and because your work has the, an element of documentary in it, um, and you don't seem to have people in your work that much. Do you, do you, how do you think about agent, your own agency as you're making those images and the agency that, that you have like to, to make those, those pictures? Um, that's something I'll have to ponder a little bit on, but um, I kind of on purpose try to make sure that there's not a ton of people always in my images because for me a lot of the time it's about the remnants the fingerprints of existence and people being in those spaces rather than them being the full focus yeah it's almost like you push all if you do have a figure in, in that's not you in your images you push them to the very back or they're like framed they're almost um framed as if they're 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 evaporating into the into the space or they're one with the space 
Yeah, well, like a lot of the time, especially like in my more current work I'm making, I kind of tend to think about the moment that's happening isn't going to last. So I'm just trying to capture it for one second. But I know it's not going to last. I know it doesn't last. And when you're even looking at the image, you're going to realize that. Your your images, too. Like, there's something... Um, uh, I don't know. Like, there's... On the one hand, I'm kind of like... I'm really drawn to them, and, and they're so beautiful, and they're... I feel like I'm in a tropical world almost part of the time. Um, but there's also this... Uh, you're avoiding the dystopia of cities in in a way, almost on purpose. Like it, you you you're kind of bending it all. Is that is that fair? Yeah, I mean, uh, I, f I I think it's it's just like a similar thing that I said earlier. I feel like there's a lot of storytellers that would lean towards one thing, but then I don't know if it's just me being whatever way. But I'm just always drawn to like the more optimistic, positive <laughs> sides of things. As just like the kind of person I am, and I'm always, like always looking back with like rose tinted glasses, or looking at the current moment, like wow, this is amazing, or like this is never going to happen again, or like like look how beautiful kind of thing. It's like if if you know me in my personal life, it's probably kind of annoying, <laughs> but uh, that's just that's just me kind of just being yourself, being myself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which is which is a very nice thing to have, and especially in this moment that we we all find ourselves in. Um, so how about influences for, for all of you? I could tell you who I see in all of your work, but that's not fair. Um, so maybe you can talk about some of your influences. Fedjid, do you want to take that? Yeah, sure. Um, I think uh, one of my biggest influences right now is probably Spike Jones. you know, someone who also started in skateboarding and uh, went into the music video route and, you know, has been creating really just fun work, you know, I think, um, while I don't know, I, I think maybe our work looks very different, but it's just, I, I, I love his spirit and his youthfulness that he brings to his work. And I think, uh, I try to like embody that sometimes in my commercial work, not so much the personal stuff. Um, but yeah. Okay. Isabella, how about you? Um, I'm going to be so honest, my influences, you probably don't see my work at all, but they are all artists that I hold really dear to my heart. So like Nan Golden, um, she was one of like the first photographers I ever looked at when I was in high school. And coincidentally, we share a birthday, which I always think is so funny. Um, and she's like one of my favorite photographers, like to the day I die. She's like amazing. And I really look up to her and especially because she's very like active still um, in her stance around like harm reduction and like different forms of activism. And she really like puts that in her work currently. And I always really admired that. Um, and then also like Ryan McGinley um, and Rebecca Belmore have always been really big influences on me. Okay. And how about Jeremy? Um, I, it, in some of my past work, I was really inspired by Wong Kar Wai and like, just the cinematography from his movies. Um, and maybe up until recently, like uh, really inspired by Frank Ocean, the musician, just his storytelling, his themes of nostalgia and memory and how he evokes kind of just like, um, I don't know, put has a way of like telling you a story that really puts you there and makes you feel like you live that same experience. That was really, really um, inspiring to me. And that's... Uh, something that I aspire to. Mm. Okay, awesome. Um, I'm going to shift gears in a moment, but I'm just wondering if we have any uh, questions from the audience um, that, that about how many of you have had the opportunity to see the work that these guys have, uh, have ha been making? Not, not, not a lot of you. Okay. All right. Yeah, question. For so I've only really been... Uh, I've been mainly exposed to Jeremy's work, uh, but I've since finding out about this panel, I've explored you guys as well. But with uh, Jeremy's work, how do you, when you approach a project or you choose like uh, a shoot, are you constantly just doing that context, just film at all times now? Or are you choosing between digital and film between 
certain different projects? It depends. Uh, I think for a lot of my personal work, I'll always bring some film with me because it just gives me a starting point in terms of like uh, what I want the image to look like. Um, because I don't know, with digital the possibilities are like literally limitless. You could go anywhere. So at least it gives me an attachment to the rest of my body of work. Um, yeah, but it depends on the project. Yeah. Okay, do we have other questions? And I'm just gonna, okay, we'll keep going. Um, so uh, Isabella, back to you for one second. Uh, color, you, you're not all that interested in color. Uh, can you talk about your love of black and white? Yeah, um, I don't like color uh, because I feel, <laughs> that sounds so wild. Um, I just feel it really uh, manipulates the emotions. I'm going to be so honest. Um, I like the starkness of black and white. Um, I feel like there's a richness to it. Um, and I think like it's a really great way to be able to like get story across without you know, romanticizing an image, creating nostalgia, um, because a lot of my work isn't engaging with that, and I don't want people to fall into that with my work. Cool, okay. And your work, um, you're, you're constantly dealing with, um, your predilection is to go to that darkness, but sometimes you're, you're, you're throwing a lot of color in there, especially a lot of red. Like, I see a lot of red in your work. Can you talk about that? Um, I don't know if I've actively thought about uh, color in this way of, you know, leaning towards one color or uh, leaning towards red specifically. Um, I do think that depending on the project, you know, red can, it's like the color of love and uh, also blood and it represents many things. But I think uh, it's, it is a really um, intense color that, you know, it immediately strikes something in people's eyes and it kind of, uh, I don't know, I guess I, I haven't, I can't really say that I've actively thought about, you know, why I use red or anything like that. So, yeah. Okay. Um, and we could talk about color forever with you. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, so let's talk about uh, your work a, a little bit as, as we shift gears into the commercial side of things. So you guys are all working with clients, um, and I'm just sort of wondering what that's like. I mean, you know, you, how do you maintain, first of all, in working with clients and, and someone who's had the opportunity to make myself films for broadcasters, so I appreciate that there, there's, you know, the, the connection. Um, how, how do you bridge that gap? How do you, like, maintain your artistic integrity and like still, you know, get um, paid for your work. For me, if I'm being totally honest, uh, when I first picked up a camera, I had no, um, I don't know, I had no sense of like the fine art world or like um, my, my photography existing within our historical context and like not until I came here. So, um, I think I think like for me my intention like it might sound bad but the, my my intention was always like I love this camera like I love taking pictures and I don't want to do anything other than this like how do I just make this the only thing that I do so that was always the thing that I was focused on and then the the more like the personal art practice um cuz I'm not going to claim that I'm like a fine art photographer um it kind of came after like when I was here and um not that I want to go into the entire story, but um, yeah, uh, I always basically like in between, um, I don't know, in between projects or when I'm in a lull or I like I have no, um, don't know where to go next with image making. That's when I'll always come back to like personal work and like trying to tell whatever story that I feel like I, I have. And then that usually becomes like the, the compass to where I'll go next. I mean, when you're, when you're working with um, a brand and you have a contract, do they own all the intellectual property that you're creating for them? Or you seem to have a lot of stuff that is yours. Is is that just stuff you shot and you want as representation of you? And, and then my next question would be leading out of that is, are, are you able to license your work too? Like, you know, is, is that something that you do? 
Um, so a lot of, yeah, a lot of the work on my website is just stuff that I shot because yeah. I wanted to. Um, and then I've been trying to get the client work to become more like that. Yeah, um, yeah I think, so with with uh, intellectual property and licensing, it all really, when it comes to clients, it all really depends on how you negotiate it and what you sign. Like, um, no matter what, like if you took the photo, you're the copyright owner and you're like the image maker. And unless you sign away your rights, then it still belongs to you. Um, and then whether or not you get hired for um, a project or not depends on how you kind of negotiate that. Because like if somebody's trying to make their job easy, they're just going to say like uh, this is a work for hire contract and like we own all the images in perpetuity and everything. Um, and it really depends on where you are in your career or like what whether it serves you or not, whether you want to accept something like that. Right? Like if, if you've never done a job before and it's really, really beneficial for you and your portfolio and your like, I don't know, for your experience to take on something that doesn't necessarily have the most ideal terms, then you make that decision for yourself. But for the most part, <laughs> you want to read the terms and look out for yourself and negotiate based off that. Right. So you've got to be your own business person too. Yeah. yeah. So Fedya, can you address that with the, some of the clients that you have? How do you maintain that artistic integrity that, that you want to bring to the project and what they may want uh, in working with you? Um, I think the most important thing is honestly just developing a good relationship with maybe a producer or whoever you're working with because uh, once you have a certain amount of trust with that person, I mean, you can you can really start to say, you know, what, how you feel about certain things and go, hey, well, I work in video, so it's like if a shot if I know I'm not going to use a shot in an edit that they really, really want, I mean, I'll talk to them. I'll tell them, like, hey, this is not, you know, like, I know you might think that it'll look a certain way, but I'll tell you right now, like, it's not going to look that way. And, you know, so I think that there's, like, it's just communication, really. I think you just need to um, be, uh, you know, firm on what you, what you believe will look good in the edit and in post and all that stuff. But then... Uh, at the same time, there's a level of flexibility that you need and you need to understand that like it's not about you necessarily if, when it comes to commercial work. it's you're filling a service for like a client. So I think it really depends. but uh, generally speaking, I would just say like being being firm with the client. Has that led you to work with the same clients again and again, or how how you 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 talk about the importance of the relationship that you might have with that particular producer or client is that allowing you to get repeat business so to speak i think so yeah because uh after a certain point you know when you stand up for yourself in those situations and you say like hey you know this is you know we're going to save time by doing this or doing that or whatever it might be you know you might it's all these little things too like whether like it's the little choices you make like do we use this camera do we use this lens like do you know what i mean like it's all it all comes down to like lighting and all these choices that you make and ultimately to make that project your own you have to make a series of decisions and uh you know have them co-sign it but I, I find like it really does depend on the client like if i'm working with a new client i'm not going to just like you know uh i'm going to just see how they work i'm going to see kind of observe and you know i'll give my two cents where it's necessary but at the same time you have to you know i have to understand that like i'm new to this and to this environment and you know you have to kind of adapt and be flexible sometimes too so can you talk about um situations that you found yourself in where you maybe it was looking pretty dire and you were able to like figure a way out of out of a, a tough situation can you give us an example um oh man for like a specific example I don't have to name the client. No, no, no. <laughs> Imagine throwing people under the bus. Um, but no, I can't I can't think of like a specific example off the top of my head, but there's always little like ethical quest ethically questionable things that might be happening on set. And it's important to speak up and kind of I don't know, I think I, I guess an example would be like, you know, maybe I've been on like a set or two where the talent is like extremely um, you know, um exhausted and the director is just pushing through and they just want to keep going and going and going and it's like 
you know, you can't be doing that to people. You have to, at some point, someone has to stand up for them or someone has to say something. And I've been that person before where it's like really awkward to have that conversation, but just like, hey, like, let's stop, you know, like this is, this is too much. Like there's, you're not going to get a good product out of this. Like, um, yeah, I think, I think that's important. Mm. Okay. Uh, Isabella, are, are have you had the opportunity to also to work um, more? I didn't have an opportunity to see if there was commercial work on your website, but, but I'm in, I'm thinking that, that all, that is part of what you do. Um, yeah, I actually am a photographer in like the punk metal and hardcore scene. Yes. Yeah. Um, and I'm really fortunate that I get to go to festivals. I get to be in arena settings and take photos. Um, and that's kind of where my freelance and commercial work comes in. Um, it definitely is a lot different than being on a set because it's very like sporadic and you're like in a living moment. Um, and I guess like my two cents to the question is like sometimes because you're in such a like lively environment and things are the adrenaline's really high you have to kind of learn how to navigate and like navigate also like people with high emotions and like when things go sideways and making sure that you're taking care of yourself but also like you're being mindful of the people around you um so yeah <laughs> so you're are you going to punk shows and taking image are you contracted to take those images or are you taking them and then trying to find somebody to take them afterwards or how, how does it work a mix of both so i'm willing to be in the most cuttiest diy spot to get pictures um and then i'll be like at like legitimate venues um where i'm like contracted by a promoter or I'm like contracted by the band um and in those moments it's like that's my client like they trust me they know what i do they know my style they know that i'm the weirdo with an analog camera at a live concert um, i'm not sure why <laughs> Um, and just to, I guess, wrap my point, um, it's just like they know that there's a built-in trust. So, yeah. There's a photographer I just have to tell you about that um, you may already know about. Her name is Bev Davies. Yeah. Um, have you, do you know her work? Okay, awesome. We'll have to talk about that. Yeah. Uh, in a film that I did, I used some of her work this a long time ago, of punk work. So just her images are amazing. Yeah. Okay, um, so uh, you each each of you has a, a, a brand that that you seem to have managed to create around yourselves. Um, can you talk? I mean, I mean, this is new for me because I'm an oldie, but like you know, but can you talk about branding yourself? I mean, it's never something we had to do. I'm sorry, you, know, you guys have to do it. Like it's, I can't believe it. Ah. Yeah, boo. Yeah. Can you talk about that? Because you're 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 on social media. You're like um, you've got to have an Instagram presence. You got to like be out there. You got to be promoting all the time. How do how do you manage that? Uh, it's not easy, uh, but, but I guess you just have to um, try to find a way to translate your voice in the most authentic way that you can uh, and do, um, I don't know, share your work in a way that uh, feels true to you uh, and then continue to do that. Because if you're pretending to be something that you're not, then you're more likely to trip up and like, I don't know, not come off as genuine or what, whatever it is. So for, for me personally, I should probably say, uh, yeah, I've just been trying to like, uh, shoot and show the things that I'm into, have a point of view that is true to the way that I see things and uh, act that same way in person and on set. And uh, yeah, easier easier to just be yourself and harder to trip up if you're just doing that. How, how conscious are you of branding yourself in this in this world that you find yourself in? Like, how much does that come into play when you're thinking about 
uh, who you want to work with as a, as a commercial photographer, because you're sort of getting to a point where you're saying with the work that I see, you're sort of saying, this is who I am. This is what I do. And do you sort of ever go, I don't think I'm the right person for you because I'm like, this is what I do. Or how, how do you negotiate, navigate all that? I think earlier on my, in my career, I was more, um, more fixated on getting experience and learning how to uh, create high quality images over and over again in any kind of situation and learn different types of lighting, learn how to work with people and things like that. But then I guess now uh, through developing a little bit more of my own style, I'll be able to kind of, I guess, uh, what I'm trying to do is share more of the work that I'm interested in so that hopefully I'm getting hired for more of the work that I'm interested in. Uh, and if I'm not getting hired for the work that I want to be hired for, I'll try to go out and come up with my own project that I can go out and make that reflects the thing that I hope that I can uh, get hired for and then go and make that because I if I really wanted to make it and I really was inspired, I was going to make it anyway. So just finding more ways to just like continue creating uh, things, yeah, things things that I like. And then, yeah, obviously with the mind of like, oh, if I want to work with, I don't know, uh, this chair brand and I'm really into chairs, then why wouldn't I go out of my way on my personal time to go take pictures of chairs that I would have made anyway. And then hopefully an art director or a designer or somebody is inspired by my picture of chairs and then thinks that's perfect for the project that we're going to be making. So that's kind of the approach. Yeah, you know, in, in a former life, I've had many former lives, I used to represent directors. And and I I, I see that in, your, in all of you. You're all... You know, you're all building your work all the time. Like it's a constant thing, whether that work is paid for or not. Like, how how is that something that you practice as well, Fedya? Um, yeah, I mean, to be honest, like I've only been freelancing for like two years now, uh, and I think I'm at that phase that Jeremy's talking about, where you're just you're trying to basically survive in this world, and it's it's difficult. It's not an easy thing to get your footing in, and I think like. Uh, I'm just now getting to a place where I'm starting to express myself and figure out what I want to do with my work. And um, yeah, I think it's it's very difficult to navigate. It's like one of the hardest things that I've had to navigate as like a filmmaker because, um, you know, yeah, I think a lot of people just, you know, do this and it's it's a, they feel as though it's a service that they do for other people. And there's nothing wrong with that. I think that's great. And that's what commercial filmmaking is. But then, um, you know, the fulfillment side of things, you will never really feel uh, fulfilled through commercial work. You know, I think that's the reality, like working with certain brands and certain artists, like maybe it'll make you feel good in the moment. But I think uh, long term, you know, you have to kind of figure out what it is that is important to you uh, and, you know, work from there. So uh, I want you to imagine that uh, all of you take pause for a second, and this is maybe something that the the audience can do too as, as well, is that you're, 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 it's the perfect scenario for you. You're able to do what it is that you want to do, and somebody's actually paying you for it. So, so, and so they're, they've, they've hired you because you are the person to do this job. And I want you to think about what that would be, but I'm going to make you the guinea pig and ask you first, Isabella. Ooh. <laughs> um, it's my dream. So it's like, this is my dream project, essentially. Um, okay. I know exactly what it is. Um, I would be hired by I don't know who. I'm not sure who would hire me to do this, but I would get to go back to Chile, where my mother's from, um, and make an experimental film, essentially, and then also a photo series on my family and their journey to Canada as political refugees. So that's what I would do. <laughs> that's a dream project, but I don't know if anyone would ever fund that. <laughs> How about you? We were talking about a little bit about this before, I think, that you do have a dream project. Maybe it's not the one I'm thinking of. Yeah, um, 
it's kind of interesting because it's somewhat similar to what you're talking about. Like I, I'm currently thinking about like a project, uh, which is like a documentary about my grandma and her story of being an artist in the Soviet Union and escaping uh, Russia with my grandfather uh, through interesting ways. But basically, um, I think in a way like that is my dream project as well um, because it touches on the personal side and it's something that you can, sh you know, in a way, like when you work with family, it's something that is important to you and it's near and dear to you, but uh, it can relate to a lot of other people. And you can also kind of use that as documentation in the future and show your grandchildren or show people in the future that like, this is where you came from. So I think, um, yeah, for me, that is, that's kind of the dream as well to get, to get money for that would be pretty, pretty nice, pretty you know, sweet, you know yeah. Canada council. huh? <laughs> And Jeremy, same question. Uh, the 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 answer to this moves and changes a lot. Yeah. But I don't know. I think I think down the line one day it would be cool to to make a movie or something like that. But that's not like really anything that I'm working on right now. Yeah. And and if you made that movie, what would that movie be about? Uh, I think I had to live a little more in order to tell you. <laughs> yeah. I don't think I have the movie yet. I don't think I've lived whatever the movie's gonna be, but um, maybe one day. Right. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I'm just gonna jump around a little bit here and then maybe we can go to some questions from the audience. Um, so um, I also wanna talk about your, your work with, in, with activism. Um, you, uh, th that's something very important to you. Um, can you talk a little bit about what you're doing when you're out there? Are you taking pictures or are you, are you observing or are you, are you part of the active process of protest or how does it work? So, yeah, I'm active in the protest. Um, yeah, I was raised in a really political family. Um, as I touched earlier, my grandparents, they came here as political refugees. They were part of the MIR, which is the Movimiento Escarreta Refugio. Revolucionario, so the leftist movement that was um, fighting against the military dictatorship in Chile. Um, so it's very much like at the roots and core of who I am. Um, I grew up on the front lines. My mom was literally six months pregnant at Cleocoat. Um, yeah, yeah. And I was at Ferry Creek. I've also been... Um, mom was six months pregnant with you? Yep, <laughs> with me at Cleocoat. Um, I think she was chained to a tree or something. Yeah, so wild. Yeah, um, it's in my blood to be a political activist and to be politically active. Um, so that's something that I partake in as an artist as well, because I think we have to be active in the everyday. Um, and I think that's something that's extremely important to employ when we're using a camera in any way, shape or form, because historically it has been used as a tool of colonization and oppression. But we are the holders of that tool. You know, we can change that. How, how do you, how, how will you change that? Um, well, in my case, um, my whole thesis actually was about the pipeline that was happening in Hope, BC, which is the town I grew up in. So I was using my camera while I was on the front lines to document a lot of the extraction colonialism that was happening. Um, and I used that as a way to parallel tell the story of coming of age, because this was also the town I grew up in where, you know, I learned a lot of my life from. Um, and for me, it was like using the camera to tell not just my story, but to tell the story of the land, the place that I love, and also kind of tell the story of how to exist in spite of these forms of active extraction that were happening and active like colonial violence that were happening. Um, and that's something that I still try to do in my everyday with the camera, you know? And your work, I, I don't know if there's an element of activism in it, but there's a, an element of like, trying to change people's minds about what they're looking at, it seems to me. Like your portrayal of African-American men is very interesting to me. You, you're, you shoot them in really interesting ways. And it, it, Am I off base there or like? Um, no, I think, I think um, during my time here at Emily Carr, there was this one uh, professor. I don't know if you're still here, Sandra Semchuk. Uh, Sandra's, uh, she's around, but she, I think she's Okay, well, she, like, we, um, it was, like, a really formative uh, critique I had with her. I had uh, 
done this project surrounding like depictions of masculinity. I don't know. It was at the time I was like trying to learn about, I don't know, fashion or whatever it was. And I didn't know what I was doing. And then I took a bunch of these photos of like these men dressed up all fancy and I showed them to her and then she looked at me and then she wasn't even looking at the photos. And then she was like, um, can you share with me what your ethnicity is? And I was like, I'm Chinese Canadian. My family came from Kuala Lumpur. Um, and then she's like, um, do you speak any language other than English? And then I was like, oh, oh no, I don't. And then there's like, do, uh, do your parents speak any language other than English? Because they grew up in a British colony. And then I was like, my dad speaks like a little bit of Malay. My mom learned how to speak Cantonese, but mostly English in our household. And then she said, so your project is about masculinity. You're a Chinese man, but all of your depictions of men are white men. And then I, I like did like felt like the blood just like dropped out of my head, and I like felt like my world was like flipped upside down because I was like, oh, I didn't even know that I had this like, um, what what's the word? Just like this worldview that like whatever the western philosophy was was what like i was trained to think was best i guess like in the way that i depicted things or like the way that i like i don't know like i was trying to in this project like make make uh depictions or images of uh hollywood movie stars like cary grant or paul newman because i saw pictures of them and i thought they were cool and they are cool that's great but then i did what i didn't realize is like oh like i'm totally pushing like myself and like who I am and my heritage totally to the side or thinking of it as like a second tier thing or whatever it is or like not like what the ideal is so uh I don't know after I had that critique obviously like I thanked her but like I was like I felt like I was spinning and then I like I was mad at myself for like quite a long time maybe like a year or two and then I was like I can't believe that I used to like think like this I can't believe like that was like this Eurocentric point of view was like so dominant in like the way that I saw things because of like movies music and like all these things that I like love and I still do but I just had to re like I guess like relearn like oh okay like these things like the world that I grew up in is still like a part of who I am but also like where I come from like my heritage are like uh uh, a huge part of like who I am and how I see things and then relearning how to like depict things that were from a point of view of like um, yeah the cross cultural cultural identity that I hold like I'm from a group grew up here but like my family's from somewhere else and like they grew up in a British colony and that obviously has a way of affecting the way that they saw things and the way that I was raised here in another British colony so like I I just like I was harboring this really like negative feeling towards I guess like the way like the world and everything until I realized like that's not really like me and like that's not really the way I can act like not really the way I can be productive so I thought like okay using um yeah using my camera using my own perspective how do I romanticize other types of people how do I start to like relearn how to love my like my own culture my like other other people and like show different types of like de depictions of people from the way that I truly saw it like with my renewed perspective I guess and then I've been trying to do more and more of that um throughout my career yeah and it really comes across especially in some of those images that I of the African-American men because you treat them with such reverence but at the same time you don't um uh, a lot of imagery that I see sometimes is they're angry, you know, and I don't see the anger in their faces the way you've captured them, which I think is so beautiful. There's one image I want to ask you about, though. Um, you, there, you captured the guy from Beef, one of the characters from Beef, is it, I think? Oh, yeah. I recognized him. How did that come to pass? Um, so I don't know his name, I'm sorry. Yeah, Joe Lee. Uh, well, that, that was just like a random thing. I... Uh... A friend of mine from is a photographer in LA, and then whenever I visit him, I just hop in his car and we go on like he just brings me around. He's like, "Oh, we're just going to my friend Joe's house," and that's how I ended up there. <laughs> that's literally that, yeah. So it's and you made this photograph while you're he, yeah. He's an artist and he like paints uh, these like portraits, and then he does like these huge, uh, I guess they're like oil oil paint smears over the mm -hmm. faces, so you can't see them anymore. And we were in his 
uh, studio and his his clothing and the color palette and everything matched the thing. So I just asked if I could take his picture. So he's he's really an artist because he plays an artist yeah, in this show yeah. as well. Yeah, wow. he's really an artist. A very very nice guy. Cool. Can, can you talk about activism in your work? Like, I I, I think there's. That, that piece that you made, there was a short film. I'm not sure if it's your film or if it's another, you were the DOP, but there, like, um, there's a lot of things going on in that film. Like uh, there's uh, elements of commercialism, consumerism, like you're, you, they're, you know the one that I'm talking about? It's, oh, it's up, it's called Cap or something. There's an animal. Uh, I'm pretty sure it was your your page that I was looking at, unless I was looking at somebody else's work. Oh, okay. Well, is there an activism act, uh, activist part of your work? Um, yeah, uh, to an extent. I mean, I think I'm not. I wouldn't say I'm actively an activist through my work, but I think um, you know the way that I try to be in some ways is that I. Um, work with all sorts of people and um, you know I I try to um, you know especially in fashion I think it's quite important that like you work with uh, people of all of all colors and um, ethnicities and I think like representation is important and um, you know I I would say that like I I am cognizant of that but at the same time yeah I'm not uh, always thinking of it I think that it's uh, generally speaking, it's important to work with people that you trust and that trust that you will deliver for them. And, you know, in a lot of ways, my job as a DOP is to just make sure that the lighting is good and that people are represented in a way that is appealing and that makes sense. And I think, um, yeah, it's, that's really it. Yeah. Cool. Okay. Um, so you guys are all successfully pursuing what did your passions, your, your, your career, the way you like it to, you know, you've, you've really shaped your career the way you want it to be in your own, your own image, so to speak. Um, can you give advice to, you know, we have a lot of students here today who are, I'm not sure all the disciplines that, that you guys are in, but I'm sure you're all thinking about what you're going to be doing next once you escape the artistic asylum here. Um, so uh, can you tell us about, um, you know, what, what kind of advice would you give yourself if you were in art school again and you were like going to make this career about your, you know, you're going to start out in, in this world. Maybe Isabella, we haven't heard from you in a while, so I'm going to throw it over to you. <laughs> Yeah, um, I'd say like my biggest advice is just like, don't be afraid to not know what you're doing and to like not know anything really. Like it's one of those things where it's like, it's okay to experiment. It's okay to be wrong. Um, it's okay to take a minute to like find your voice um, and like read and learn as much as you can. Take that workshop, take that class, like do everything you can to explore your art practice and find your voice and find your foundation because if you're going into anything related to freelance or commercial work like that's what you're going to like hold at your core and like what you're going to rely on the most especially like in moments where you might feel like you're second guessing yourself so really develop that foundation Do you want to talk, talk a little bit about that as well what, what would you what would you tell yourself um what would advice would you give to the young Fedya yeah, who was at Emily Carr thinking about what he was going to do? Would would you a ever imagine yourself in this place? And b what what advice would you give yourself now that you're wise and and uh, learned and accomplished? I don't know about that, but um, <laughs> um, I mean, I, like I said, I've only been doing this for about like two years, so I think I'm really in the thick of it as we speak, and I just. I guess I would just tell myself to not be afraid, not be afraid to put out your own work and not be afraid to uh, speak to clients in a certain way and not be afraid to um, use your voice, you know, to an extent. Uh, and, you know, because it, film is, it, it's an intimidating space sometimes and it's really, uh, you know, not easy to get your footing. Uh, and 
I think commercial film, especially it's, yeah, it can be really intimidating working with big brands or big clients for the first time. And, um, I think it's important to just know that like everyone that you see around you was in your position at some point, you know, they had no idea what they were doing. So, yeah. I mean, how did you, um, arrive at the first client that you had? Like, how did you manage to secure them and make it happen? How, what was the process by which you did that first paying job? Do you remember what that was like? Um, I, was really lucky because my first paying job uh, was actually like a full-time opportunity. It was for a brand called Sheertex. Uh, they're based in Montreal and they were hiring a in-house content creator. And basically what that meant was like they wanted someone who was like a DOP, but someone who could also shoot little pieces of content on an iPhone and provide like social media stuff and someone who could like edit and do all sorts of things in that regard. And I think... I, I guess the way that I got into it was it's not it's not like a normal way that a lot of people get into freelance. But um, for me, I started doing that. And then eventually I worked my way up a little bit. And then I quit that job after a year because it was just insanely stressful. And uh, <laughs> like, you know, you're getting, um, no, aside from that, like, I don't know, I, I just sort of uh, used the producers that I had met after that job and like talk to them and um you know with all the connections that i had made being on set so many times um i then like branched out and started my freelance career in that way but that was only like two years ago so wow it's quite meteoric to like you know be go from from where from the beginning to where you are now because it's it's very tough and like people spend years on film sets before they get, you know, that they get the dream of looking through the camera and shooting it, it must be, must be wild to be in that position. Um, yeah, yeah, it's really, <laughs> it's really nice. I mean, I, um, I try to be grateful. I think like it's, um, there could, I don't know, it's like this. There's this artist hunger that we all, I think, have where you could always do better. And sometimes, you know, being like on social media too much, you look at other people and you're like, oh, I want to do that. I want to do this and it, there's there's struggles that come with it too, but I think ultimately, like um, I'm grateful to be doing what I'm doing and to be, I guess, getting paid to do that. And uh, yeah, I would I just now I'm trying to figure out my where the creativity kind of lies in that and where the um, uh, I guess where my personal work lies in that. Right. Yeah. Right. What, what what advice would you give? You've had a bit, bit of time now. Like, you, what advice would you give your your younger self? Um, I think the advice that I would give my younger self is uh, <laughs> just yeah, similar to what Isabella said. Just don't be afraid to fail. Like, because um, one of my good friends, the thing he always says is the only way that you're ever going to get good at something is failing repeatedly until you know how to do it. So just like. Just keep making work and like pick a North Star of where you want to be right now and then figure out how you're going to like how you are going to try to get there. Nobody's journey looks the same and that North Star will probably change all the time. But just like figure out how you're going to get there. Find friends who to collaborate with you that are also trying to trying to learn and grow and then you can build a community from there. Um, don't be so hard on yourself. Um, and the one thing that I just kind of figured out that like encapsulates the way that I think is like a good way of thinking about things is like if you're thinking about being a commercial photographer, it's not the same as like a job you get hired for where it's like you're a photographer now. It's kind of like it's a journey. It's like a it's a it's it's like a constant journey. It's like a journey that I'm still on. There's always something that you want to be doing next or whatever it is. And um, as long as you kind of keep that hunger, you keep inspired, like follow what inspires you, um, you're gonna eventually get there. It'll, it might take years, it might take time, but you just have to understand that like things take time every time that you fail or every time that there's like some type of thing that falters you, as long as you just keep going, you're going to find yourself somewhere. It might not look exactly the same as what you thought it would at the very beginning, but if you keep going, you're going to find yourself somewhere. Um, and what was the other thing? Uh, can't remember. No, it's okay. Um, it, I just had a care, question out of curiosity more than anything at this point. Um, is there ever a day that any of you go through where you don't pick up a camera or you aren't learning something about it 
how it works or what it or shooting something or looking through it or taking a picture i'm just sort of curious oh you've got a microphone sorry um no <laughs> Um, I carry a little point and shoot in my bag. Like I'm constantly taking photos, um, like of my friends of life, just because like, to me, it's brings me so much joy and it's very anchoring. Um, and I'm just always forever curious about it. So I'm always going to be engaging with photography somehow. How about you, Fedja? Um, I mean, to be honest, yeah, I do have days where I kind of don't want to think about it and I'm just like, let's relax, let's, you know, like take our mind off things. But then, you know, you watch a movie and then you're just looking at the lighting and you're like thinking about, I don't know, at least for me, I'm thinking about like the technical side of things. But I think, um, yeah, it depends. I think it's good to take breaks and kind of uh, just let your mind, you know, you need to, in some ways, similar to what Jeremy said, like you need to live a little bit to like be able to see a movie and or to be able to, um, you know, write a movie. You need to like, you, you need to live, you need to go out, you need to do other things and then mm -hmm. you'll draw inspiration from other things. So, yeah. How about Jeremy? Do you, do you take pictures all the time? Yeah, I take pictures all the time. Uh, it, it is really nice to take breaks and like, uh, I don't know, live, like, can, like find inspiration from other places, whether it's other forms of art, other people having conversations is always like a really big one living of course but like um i think all camera people can understand the fact that like you kind of use your as your wayfinder right like if you if you're stuck and you don't know where you're going to go next if you go point your camera at something most likely it's going to tell you something about where you're going to go or like what you're drawn to or whatever it is so you just gotta like you have to kind of just go in it with the mentality of like I was going to do this anyway. I was always going to be taking pictures anyway, and I'm doing it my, for myself. Or like if I'm being hired, um, they're borrowing my time. But once, once my time is back, I'm back to taking pictures. For, so yeah, just like whatever keeps you going, if, you, if it's taking a break or shooting. But I mean, if you were going to be doing it anyway, you're going to be taking pictures anyway. Cool. Okay, I'm. I want to get some audience questions. Uh, in in uh, go on. So, do we have questions from the audience? Okay. Um, Jeremy, I think you mentioned it like a little bit, talking about um, relationships. Um, it's kind of felt that, uh, or I felt that in at least the art scene, networking and community is so essential. Um, do you find that also is the same with, um, uh, with, with doing in industry work or with commercial work? And, yeah. and just expand you know, everyone's opinion on, on these different things? Uh, yeah, definitely. Uh, I mean, in any, yeah, uh, in my experience, um, uh, having good relationships with people and uh, being nice to work with and being like I don't know. Um, let me let me think about this a little. I, I guess more so to just like how did you get into these? You know, like how did you you start with these relationships oh, or, or you know what was your experiences getting into these spaces? Um, I guess, yeah, when, when I was trying to figure out where I would start, uh, I was just reaching out to people whose work I admired uh, and then asking them questions about how they got started. Um, and through, like, talking to them, a lot of the time it was a similar thing to what I said to you. It's like, oh, okay, go out and make projects that look like the things that you want to. And in order to do that, you have to, a lot of the time, assemble a team. So you got to find contemporaries, people who are like in a similar spot as you and be like, hey, do you want to like learn and grow together essentially? And if you uh, have mutual interests, if you like genuinely connect with people, you can have like these long lasting, like really fruitful um, relationships, collaborations and all these types of things. And then it will most likely just organically, like I said, if you're being true to yourself and being honest with like the people that you're working with and like 
genuinely pursuing the things that inspire you, most likely that will spark something in somebody else. And like, it, it'll just, it'll just unveil it, uh, yeah. That I, I I don't know if I explained that very yeah. well. No, no, you did. Yeah. And and I'm curious too, um, what you guys think and and what your experiences have been. Um. Yeah, I think uh, just in general, it's really important to speak with uh, you know the people that you might work with or potential people that I don't know. If you have people like in a community, like let's say here at Emily Carr, you have your you know uh, your contemporaries, people that you're already working with, like. When you graduate, you're going to make that decision of like, do I stay here or do I leave? And if you stay here, you have a community of people that are already with you, you know, and like are on the same exact page as you. And I think like building uh, your community with those people is super important. And um, in general, like, I don't know, I think uh, trying to seek out producers just as like a personal thing, it's it's I find that's very useful because those are the people that you know, if you're working in film, like those are the people that you want to meet. And um, there's a way to do that that maybe won't, that it doesn't come off super like, you know, oh, I need your help. And da, da, da. like, you can just be kind and respectful and ask like, how did you get into this position? Like, you know, can I help out on set? Like really just put yourself out there uh, amongst like other people and let them know that like you're, you know, someone that would want to work for free and work on many sets and just, you know, do that enough and eventually you'll, you'll find those people. Yeah. Um, yeah, just like building relationships is extremely important. Um, here at Emily Carr is a great place to start because you're amongst your peers, you're amongst people who have similar interests and, you know, people who have similar goals. Um, so fostering your friendships and your relationships here and then like kind of continuing them as a professional is extremely important because you never know like when you'll get to work together again, you never know how those relationships can form into further collaboration in the future, right? Um, and yeah, and just trying to be like mindful and caring as you navigate those things, I think is extremely important. We have other questions. Thank you for that question. It was a good question. <coughs> Do we have other questions? Come on, you guys have questions. I'm sure you got. Oh, there's a question. Hi, hello. So, question for all of you: uh, Is there anything you wish you had known about like your own position or the field before you started? The work like not even just i'm not even only talking about like artistic skills but also like knowledge about finance or contracts or like social skills anything really that to any of the panelists oh, oh, I see. Okay. Is, there, is there anybody who would like to take that on okay <laughs> i'll start okay. um yeah i think uh honestly i think one of the hardest things about freelancing in general is like being your own boss and stepping up like really you know stepping up for yourself and being like a force to be reckoned with in some ways because like I don't know people will take advantage of you and that's just a part of the learning experience uh, unfortunately you know I wish it wasn't but um, you know it's really important to get contracts as soon as possible I mean it's it's very hard like because there's this position of power that you're in where you know you're not really when you're starting out you're not you don't feel like you have the um what's it like the like chutzpah to even like <laughs> just you know put out a contract and say like i you know i need this client to sign this and that but i think it's it's important to just um really know that like you don't have a hr as a freelancer your hr is like your community other people that are around you that you can talk to and um yeah i would just say yeah, looking out for yourself more it, uh, is like one of the biggest things that, um, yeah. Are, th are there, this is a question just to le leading on from that, are there still, there used to be, and I, I'm dating myself maybe, um, agents for, for cinematographers, for photographers, is that still part of this world? Uh, yeah, yeah, I think so. I mean, it is, it is. Uh, and there's representation and, you know, people can get agents and stuff like that. But I would say like when you're just starting out, it's really difficult to attract one, attract one you know, yeah. I, I, I think 
that takes so many years. I mean, yes. I don't want to say that to discourage people. I just think like you build your community over years and then yeah. eventually, you know, hopefully someone will reach out or if you're really pragmatic, maybe you can find someone. But yeah, in, in the beginning, you have to be your own boss. Your own boss. Yeah, that that's it's hard. I, that, um, one thing that I learned is like the big misconception about like agencies and agents. It's like, I get signed by an agent and that means I get all this work. But in 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 reality, uh, being signed by an agent is like a, is like they want you as much for your clients that you already have as you want them for like their promotional machine. So it's not like um, it's not like you get this agent and you've made it and you're set. Uh, there are some scenarios for some photographers where it's it's like that, but a a lot of the time it's like for them to even look in your direction, you're giving them something. So it's like, it's not to say it's not a good thing, but it's not one of those things wh where you should, yeah, you should be disregarding the things that Eddie was saying. It's mostly about like building it all up uh, for yourself, advocating for yourself and um, yeah. Did you want to jump into this, Isabella? Um, well, my thing's a little different. Mine is that like, going into freelance and going into commercial work um, and being your own boss, like learn to do your taxes. <laughs> I didn't know how to do that. And it, yeah, learn to do your taxes. It's really important. And read contracts. Read contracts. Yeah, that's, oh boy, yeah. If I may jump in, um, as an Emily Carr student, you can always take those professional courses. I think the prof is the mnemonic for that right now. The other things that are, there's Shamka Center for Creative Entrepreneurship that can help you. Uh, I'm speaking on behalf of Shamka right now. And you can always talk to your uh, professors. They themselves are working artists. They work in the field and they might be able to mentor and support you or at least point you towards other resources. And another one is CARPAC. So it tells you what your rights are as an artist and you can maybe negotiate some fees around that. And they might also have some workshops and things around taxes and contracts as well. So, yeah. Yeah. More questions. This young gentleman here. Um, I've heard from a few people that assisting is a really good way to get into the like commercial photography world. Um, is this something that you guys have done, have experience in, have some advice in? Uh, I don't, did you, uh, yeah, who would like to take that? Yeah, ass assisting can be definitely a great way to learn, um, uh, learn the ins and outs of being on set because it's like very nuanced and there's like a lot of things that you can only really learn by being there like what your role is how to act like what people's positions are and stuff like that so if you can find a photographer who's uh, looking for assistance it's a good place to start uh, and I think they let, let me let me think in my memory about like what f other assistants have told me and get back to you does anybody want to? Um, yeah, I've been an assistant before, actually. Um, and it was like out in the field for an experimental um, filmmaker, Lindsay McIntyre. Mm. Um, yeah, she's uh, amazing. I love her. <laughs> um, but yeah, um, assisting is amazing. And it's like a really great opportunity, especially if it's with the right artist. You can learn so much, like just about the industry, but also like just learn a lot about your own art practice, like doing that. I'll just jump in here too. Uh, if you're working in the camera department in film, it's a little bit different in the fact that you want to uh, move from like a camera PA to a, uh, like there's many designations. And then there's the union culture too that you can get yourself into because you could be a third assist, a second assist, a first assist camera. You could be, uh, deal, like, there's all these hoops that you jump through in order to get to that penultimate point if you're a, an IATSE cameraman, I think. So there's that. And then there's the commercial world in which you seem to be focused more in as a cameraman that has none of that in a way. Like, it's just like, it's all your skill and everything is, is you're building as you go, right? Yeah, I think... Uh 
in general, like this can be applied to photo and film, but um, I would say like really um, just assisting a lot on anything. It's, it's a really good way to meet people and just to, you know, like uh, show that you can do that and like see how the process, see how they're using this light, see how like, you know, just taking notes in your head of how this photographer is doing this. It's really important, but then also just like, you know, making sure that they're aware that you're also doing photo work and you're, you know, if something happens, like not nothing bad, but you know, if like they're sick one day or something happens, like you can take over and you can start doing the taking photos or video. I, I think it's super important to like be a Swiss army knife in the beginning and just kind of um, do, it all. do it all. Yeah. And uh, that way you, you will find, you know, something. Uh, <laughs> so um i'm not sure if it's still up there but flashpoint rental house uh they're one of the big rental houses around here they have like a link on their website that lists uh assistance i'm not sure exactly how you could get listed on there but if you reach out to them they might be able to tell you uh and then there's another rental house uh called yuku like u-c-o-o -O, and it's run by this guy named sven who was like one of the top photo assistants for years and now he does that uh if you reach out to him he might have some insight to you on how like he got experience and then how he became formerly a photo assistant um i will say real quick too like instagram stories of like photographers that you like or people you know in the city or whatever like even other assistants you know sometimes they'll just post like hey you know i'm sick in need of assistant or whatever you know something like that so it's good to if you are on if you are active on social media it's good to check i used to know a guy named sven too i don't know if the same sven no 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 he can't be still around no no yeah. uh more questions Questions, questions. Um, Teresa, do do you uh, do you have anything that you? Um, yeah, I apologize if it already came up and I missed it. But is there ever any like ethical concerns when working with people as subjects, or anything that you've had to navigate that might be a little? sensitive or anything like that do you have any tips great question um who wants to start with that one i mean i think you and isabella you talked about your your reverence for people and your shots but but um and your stuff i can't tell whether the line is between realism and and how many of those people are like can maybe you can address this because yeah you you seem to have both things going on uh what do you mean well i mean like in some of your shots it everything's outside from what i could see like a lot of exteriors mm -hmm. and so you have humans in them um and a lot of them what, what are there are you getting people's permissions when you're making those photographs to, to teresa's point or how are you how are you proceeding sort of there um yeah even if they might seem like I just went out there, most of the time I'm uh, taking portraits with people. Yeah, and I guess like an ethical um, concern would be, for example, if somebody reached out to me regarding licensing of, a, of an image of somebody's likeness, um, you want to have either worked out like a release situation with them or an agreement or talk to them beforehand because you don't want to be going around licensing images of people without their permission or like, um yeah using images of people without their permission in general it's always good to like if you have relationships with people have conversations if you were going to use them for something and just make sure that you yeah maintain um yeah maintain good standing with the people that you work with because like they uh, like her name is Bella, so it's like basically everything does anybody want to add to that no okay are there any like sort of social skills you feel like you need in order to like get the right kind of like expression out of a model or you know does that that's a part of a job if you are working with people right so mm. how do you kind of fill in those gaps if you don't have those skills mm. um i think it it takes a long time to figure that out in a lot of ways but i i do think that um just having a conversation with the model about like this is the work that we're doing 
you know, whether that's an actor, whoever it is, like just talking, really just talking to them for like an hour or something and just sort of, um, I don't know, making people feel comfortable and good and, um, you know, positive reinforcement is always great. Like on set, I think, uh, you know, you might think that, you know, this person's a model and like, you know, they're beautiful and they, they don't have any insecurities or something like that, but everyone has insecurities and you have to, you know, um, you have to be mindful of that and just be like a positive force. And I mean, it's, it is hard because not every day like that you're shooting, you're in a good mood and you know, you don't, you're not always uh, feeling like being this positive force, but as a director, it's super important to just, to bring a positive energy to the set and really um, communicate well with the models and whoever you're working with and that'll show in the work. So, I mean, just leading from there, just, thinking about that also we live in an age now where we can all take pictures all the time every moment people are posing and posting all the time i mean i don't know how many selfies are out there but how how hard is it to direct someone in knowing that they know um how to direct themselves or they have an image of themselves based on what they see in in the lens how much of that is a challenge for you to, to to make the image that you want to make, but also honor their all their um, experience, you know, of, of of posing basically at this moment that we're in. Sorry, that this is a bit of an old man question, but like I, I'm sort of curious. I'm, I'm, yeah, Isabella, do you want to try that one? Well, so so basically, you're you're thinking about how. Um, you know the, the ubiquitousness of a cell phone at this particular making so, an image everybody taking you know their the these these shots how do you like deprogram somebody when you're making their image i feel like you can't <laughs> you know like it's just like social media like our phones like it's so in our everyday culture um like there's literally a thing called like cell phone face. Like it's, yeah, like in cinema where it's like when we're doing period pieces, it's like you can tell that person knows what a cell phone is. <laughs> yeah, and it's like one of those things where I think we can't really undo that, unfortunately. Um, and you kind of just have to like learn to, at least in, in my own practice, just kind of like learn to work around that and work through that, you know? How about in your image making? Um, I... Uh, similar to what Fabio was saying, I try to make a personal connection w in whatever way I can with the subject. So like starting without taking the photos, letting them know like how I generally work or saying something to them like, or, or just like when you talk to them, paying attention to their mannerisms and seeing how they naturally like to position their bodies uh, just in their own resting. And uh, I don't know, find, find ways to, to, well, depending on what kind of depiction you're trying to get, find, find, uh, things that you think might loosen them up or any type of thing. And then um, when you have a little bit more of that personal connection, when you've paid attention to the things that they naturally lean towards in their body language, um, then you can try to create moments that feel unposed. You can try to capture like a little bit more of like their, their essence, uh, a little bit more of like the way that you see them because photography is all about perspective. So um, if you can infuse a little bit more intention before you click the shutter of like how how am I experiencing this person how do I feel that they look like how is the light like or how am I either shaping the light or like using the light around me to like capture how this moment feels like between the two of us like really to me in my own human experience then you're I, like for me anyway that that's the key to unlocking an image that feels a lot more like a true expression of the person or like a moment that you're capturing versus something that feels like very self-conscious great answer um okay uh, houston astros guy have any any one of you guys experienced uh, when you have an, a deliverable that your client wasn't happy with? And how did you... Uh, there is a good Did question. you... What did you do with it? Who wants to take that one? 
Um, yeah, yeah, I, I have. I mean, it's <laughs> it's funny because like in the world we live in, like no client will ever tell you like we're unhappy with this directly. It's always like a passive aggressive email or something like. So I think um, it's I don't know, like. Um, I, I think this often happens with first time clients, uh, like if you're working with someone for the very, very first time and maybe you I don't know you try to put too much of yourself in the work or they put too much of themselves in the work or something like there's just a miscommunication. Like these things happen, you know? And I think, um, I can't, I have like a few examples, but yeah, I think it's just, it's, it's, it's difficult, but you just kind of have to like bite the bullet and accept that, you know, it's not a reflection of who you are. It's just, uh, maybe your style isn't really what they were looking for. And, uh, you, you know, you couldn't, make it work and, uh, you know, onwards and upwards, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> Anyone else want to try that one? Yeah, I, I, uh, I've obviously definitely had situations like that. And I think the thing that I learned from it is that, um, a lot of it can be avoided or, um, yeah, avoided before it even happens by communicating really clearly. Like if you have a client or like a brief that comes in, you could have a questionnaire asking like a certain amount of questions with things that have gone wrong before. Obviously not framing it in that way, but just like things that you know could go wrong and seeing if there's already answers for it. Like, uh, is there a producer? Is there an art director? Is there a brief? And then you, if you do have a brief or if you do have an art director, you want to make sure that you review the brief really, really well. Make sure that if you don't understand anything, you ask questions to make sure that you fully well and know. Um, to make sure that you're right, the right person for the job, like whether they ask for it or not, like you could provide like examples of past work or inspiration images that look like what they think it is if you're not seeing it or what your vision of it is. And if you don't agree beforehand, then like figure out what it is that they want so that like you and for the most part, it's, it'll be an art director, like you and the art director are very, very like hand in hand, like knowing what you're going in there to create. And then by the time you get to set, everything should be dealt with and the rest is just like fun and making it for the most part. I could tell you stories. <laughs> yeah. uh, the, the story that comes to mind, and I can tell them because I'm no longer in these, in these worlds. So um, I was filming it, I had a contract with, um, EA Sports uh, on their basketball side and we had to go to five players houses and photograph them. One of them we went to was Larry Johnson who played for the Charlotte Hornets and the New York Knicks. We went to his house. He didn't want to do the shoot because he had to shave. And he was on his on the phone literally when we got there talking to his manager for and this was over this is close to 25 years ago or longer. He was on his phone with his manager saying that he didn't want to do this. He was getting paid $15,000 for an hour of work. $15,000. That was a lot of money then. It's still a lot of money. And he wouldn't shave. And I was standing there like going, why am I here? So that's my story. Sorry. Did okay, I'm going to try. I can't say names for mine because it's kind of recent. Um, but I was taking photos of a band. I was asked by their, to be fair, smaller label. Um, I was so prepared. I had like a little vision board I made with Pinterest and stuff to send them. Um, I asked them so many questions about like, what are they going for? What are they referencing? What is the energy of like the media they want to put out for this new album and stuff and it was really interesting because they were like yeah like we're going for this like militaristic energy like guns in the woods and I was like that is interesting <laughs> um but you know like I was like well if this is what they want um and it was really interesting being on that shoot because I, my own personal style, was like, this is very strange and very weird and very different than the Pinterest board we made together. <laughs> um, and I did my best to kind of deliver what they wanted. And I gave it to them. And they're like, we don't look tough enough. 
Like, we don't look hard enough. Yeah, and then we, like, we did a reshoot, and they were more happy with the second result, but it was, it was a really funny and interesting back and forth um, because truly it was just, like, a very self-conscious moment on their side where they're like, this doesn't look hard enough. This doesn't look tough enough. And it's like, oh, well, I can't control that all the time. <laughs> Yeah, and, and maybe it's not something you wanted to, yeah, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Can I piggyback off that? So then if, so you did a reshoot, did you do that reshoot for free? Did you be like, hey, no, this is like, I've done my time, I've done my work, or are you compromising feeling like empathetic for what they wanted in the vision, sir? I did the reshoot for free, um, which, you know what? I felt a little conflicted because it is a lot of labor, but at the same time, like I want to maintain this relationship. I knew that this is a bit of a feather in my cap, you know? I knew that like if I'm able to produce this, I might be able to get bigger projects down the road, show people that I can like do this. Um, and then hopefully in those bigger projects have a little bit more say and like have a little bit more of my voice heard. But also I will add like being a femme of color does also change the dynamics in that world and kind of how you can navigate like doing a reshoot or not, right? Awesome. Any more questions? These are great. This is fun. No? You've got, yeah? Okay. All right. Well, um, I want to thank each of the panelists for being here today. Um, I certainly learned a lot. I hope you guys did too. And I really appreciate their time. So f Jeremy, Fedya, and Isabella, thank you. And, and a big round of applause for all three of you. Thank you.